from the Telesur headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela. Welcome back to From the South. I am Luis de Jesus. Let's take a look at our headlines. Roadblocks and protests intensify in Bolivia as civil groups demand the celebration of presidential elections and the resignation of the de facto president, Yanine Áñez. Primary elections partially suspended in Puerto Rico due to the lack of ballots and other irregularities. An anti-government protest has erupted in Beirut and two ministers have quit following the huge explosion registered last week at the city port. And we begin right away with the news. Stay with us. And we we'll start now with the news. Roadblocks and protests have intensified in Bolivia after the lack of answers on a definite date for the presidential elections and in demand for the resignation of the de facto president Yanine Áñez. Close to a week of protests, roadblocks and mobilizations organized by civil organizations in several regions of the country keep uninterrupted. Meanwhile, the Bolivian central workers and farmer movements assure that road blockades will be maintained on 100 routes in the Andean region, despite the pressure of irregular groups against the population. At least 60 protesters were arrested and 40 still remain in detention. Farmers and miners convened a march to be held this Monday in retaliation to the government's decision to extend the presidential elections. In that matter, in an exclusive interview with Telesur, the militant, the militant and political analyst Daniel Solis affirmed that the government faces with double intent the road blockades. The same mobilized bases throughout Bolivia are demanding for the leadership both the Unity Pact and the Bolivian Workers' Center, who have called for this mobilization that must not betray the demand of the people. As I told them earlier, all blocking points in their generality are already calling for the resignation of the de facto president, Yanine Añez. No longer elections, no longer trusting that the elections will warranty change or the democratic transition that Bolivia is wanting. The government acts with two faces, with one hand offering dialogue and with the other hand you repressing fascist groups. You are representing but the complicity of the police to the points of blockade. Solis also noted that several social organizations radicalized the measures at the blockades in response to the repression of the de facto government. Currently, the nine departments are blocked. It's free by the mobilizations convened by social organizations. The demands have initially been the elections. The election dates to be respected for September 6, as the initially was called. However, by the double face of the government, the skill of faces groups that have acted since yesterday and that in Cochamamba, trying to unblock the blockades. The blockades are radicalized. The measures and the general slogan now in most of the blockades demand the resignation of the de facto president, Yanin Áñez. And hundreds of ambitious citizens in Chile took to the streets of Caraucatín to protest against recent attacks by state forces and in support of political prisoners. The mobilizations coincides with the end of a summit of Mapuche communities from across the Araucanía region who traveled to Caraucatín to take part in the Trabún. During this summit, they debated future plans as well as the ongoing situation of political prisoners, in particular that of Mapuche leader Machi Celestino Córdoba, who's been on a hunger strike for 98 days. The mobilization also comes one week after state forces violently evicted demonstrators from a government building with the help of a violent far-right mob. In Colombia, campesinos in the region of Guayabero who were demanding an end to the forced eradication of illegal crops have been illegally detained by the country's armed forces. The campesinos that they were say they were protesting peacefully against the ongoing violence in their territory, but were met with heavy military repression, including women and children who were present. The campesinos also denounced that the soldiers stole their personal belongings and illegally detained more than 50 people. The FARC party took to Twitter to condemn the attack, adding that a humanistic doctrine is needed to guarantee the rights of the protesters where dialogue, pre dialogue prevails over force. 
they stole all my money. All they left me with is 500 pesos. Look at what they are doing here. In Brazil, fires are being set in the state of Mato Grosso, allegedly by soy farmers clearing out vegetation for their plantations. Similar acts of illegal farmers and paramilitary groups working for transnational companies were responsible for last year's destruction to the rainforest. Experts have warned that the situation could significantly worsen this year. Nonetheless, Brazil's far-right government has hailed figures that show a slight reduction in deforestation in July, when compared to last year's likely caused by a slowdown in economic activities due to COVID-19. Indigenous people in the Mexican state of Oaxaca are demanding justice for 15 members of their community who were massacred by in, back in June. Protesters have set up a camp outside the presidential palace in Mexico City to demand justice. Detectives of the 15 victims of the Wazatlan de Rio massacre were forced to leave their homes in order to demand justice for their loved ones. We have come here to demand respect for our rights and to demand that these murders be stopped. It isn't fair for violence to displace us from our homes, all while the murderers remain at large and authorities ignore our pleas. Everything started on May 2nd, when women from the Wava community decided to protest against gender-based violence in the municipality of San Mateo de Omar. After this, locals say that the women received threats from authorities and at least one of them was eventually killed. Justicia! 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 The conflict came to a head on June 22, when a group of people violently evicted a protest camp set up outside the local government building, eventually torturing and burning alive 15 protesters. These mercenaries were later linked to Jose Luis Chavez, a municipal agent who belonged to the Institutional Revolutionary Party. The prosecutor's office keeps telling us to be patient. They say arrest orders have been issued, but they have yet to receive the go-ahead from higher-ups. They already know who the killers are. Detectives of the victims were forced to flee their homes as their lives have been threatened. But this situation is nothing new for those who live in the region, as residents of Wazatland have opposed the construction of wind farms since 2012 and have therefore been targeted by transnational companies. But despite their best efforts, business interests have been encroaching in their land since 2006 by building over 500 wind turbines in what was once communal land. And we have to go now to a short break. Follow us in Twitter at Telesur English and Luis Telesur. We'll be right back. And we are back with more news. In Puerto Rico, the State Elections Commission suspended the primary elections up to next Sunday, August 16th. The decision of the electoral body comes after many of the polling stations did not receive the ballots to properly accomplish the electoral process that was supposed to develop this Sunday. According to a resolution by the electoral body on early Sunday, voting centers that began the casting of ballots could continue for the eight hours corresponding period for voting. On the other hand, voting centers that had not begun the process should, not, should resume the elections next Sunday. The situation has led several political leaders to ask for the complete cancellations of the primaries. Let no one doubt that, as governor, I will not allow the rights of our citizens to be not trampled. There must be complete transparency and absolute guarantee of the constitutional rights of our Puerto Ricans. Followed by all the events this Sunday, the correct position is to protect the vote of every person who exercises its right to vote. In the same way, the next day in that this process will continue, it is guaranteed the right to vote to all those citizens who could not vote this Sunday. And meanwhile, members of the socialist movement of workers do due to the streets again, moved to the streets again to protest against the government's lack of control on travelers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Demonstrators gathered in the entrance of Luis Muñoz Marin International Airport as they claimed that incoming travelers could trigger further spread of new infections, thus overwhelming the country's intensive care unit's capacity. 
Because of the colonial situation of the island, Puerto Rico's government can order the closure of the airports without the U.S. government approval. We have been demanding that the necessary measures we taken to control the flow of tourists to the airport. We have been seeing about 5,000 people who enter daily and the government has not had the capability to implement the necessary control measures. Only 25% of people entering have evidences of molecular testing and the other 75% are free, meaning that they should be quarantined on a voluntary basis as the government doesn't have the capability to implement it. On the other hand, we are seeing how intense care beds are already at 70% capacity. Therefore, what we are requesting, what we are demanding is that greater controls be implemented to that flow of passengers from abroad to the safeguard health and safety and that we can have a number of beds necessary to serve the population in Puerto Rico. And in the United States, the COVID-19 infection totally reached the extraordinary milestone of 5 million cases. The North American country is by far the worst affected country by the pandemic, with the highest death rate of nearly 163,000, only ahead of Brazil, which on Saturday surpassed 100,000 deaths. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump was accused of flouting the Constitution by unilaterally extending a virus relief package. Jamaica's Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the tourism-independent nation cannot close its borders despite a surge in coronavirus cases. The country currently has 1,003 positive cases of COVID-19, 745 recoveries and 13 deaths. The prospect of closing our borders for an extended period is not one that is feasible. It is not we would be cutting off our nose to spite our face. So Jamaica, more than other countries, must learn very quickly how to live with COVID-19. That is the reality. We must learn how to live with this disease. And President of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, reported 844 new cases of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. 47 of them are imported. He also informed of eight new deaths by the virus. Today we have 844 new cases, of which 797 cases are community transmitted and 47 are imported cases. As the constitutional president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, I will now sign a decree to extend the state of alarm for 30 more days, as allowed by law. 30 more days are from August 9. This will let us take the necessary measures that are needed at this time. And COVID-19 cases have surged in Venezuela despite the best efforts by authorities to contain the outbreak. As such, measures are being intensified to protect, to protect the public's health. 21 weeks after the fight against COVID-19 started, Venezuela is seeing a surge in community infections, setting new records over the past few days. Increased containment efforts have focused on providing support to healthcare workers, making medicine more widely available and setting up field hospitals to treat those infected. This pandemic is a great challenge for humanity. People need to take care of themselves and of each other. But despite the spike in cases, the recovery rate remains at over 50%. This is a difficult situation, coming on top of the blockade and the far-right attacks, but we are overcoming. Every patient who defeats the disease turns into the best advocate for preventive measures. Take care of yourselves. I do not wish this disease on anyone. It is very difficult to be isolated. To have overcome the disease has been a great victory, but there are still too many people who are ignoring how dangerous this is. In the meantime, the Bolivarian nation is working with the Pan-American Health Organization, as well as other international organizations, 
to acquire much-needed health supplies. In another subject, hundreds of Spanish protesters have taken to the streets in Madrid to denounce former King Juan Carlos for leaving the country amid a growing financial scandal. Speculation over his whereabouts gripped the nation since he announced his departure to an unspecified destination last week. Protesters accused the former king of being a thief and called for the monarchy to be abolished. Juan Carlos is the target of official investigations into possible financial wrongdoing in Spain and Switzerland. The people's outrage against the monarchy has turned into anger because we know that the greatest thief in the country escaped with the help of the government. We want to denounce that the Bourbons are thieves, that the king has been allowed to take all the money he wanted and that he has left without even being judged and without saying where he has gone. In Belarus, the leader of the opposition, Svetlana Tijanovsky, called for mobilizations to reject the preliminary results of the presidential elections announced on Sunday. Mobilizations were held in cities such as Minsk, Brest and Baits. After the preliminary results were widely led by the current president, Alexander Lukashenko, protests degenerated into violent confrontations that left several people injured. However, police forces dispersed the demonstrators and several were arrested. The events occurred amid allegations by the government of Belarus of Western interference in coordination with opposition factors for destabilizing actions of the government of Lukashenko. And the recent explosion in Lebanon's capital that resulted in over 150 deaths has erupted in a new wave of protests near the parliament in Beirut. During the second day of anti-government protests, demonstrators clashed again with Lebanese police as they tried to break into the parliament headquarters on Sunday. Lebanon's political elite faces pressure from all sides as citizens demand an end to corruption, bad governance and mismanagement. The Environment Minister Damianos Qatar and Information Minister Manal Abdel Samad both announced their resignation following the disaster that has revived anger at a ruling class seen as living in luxury while millions endure job losses, dipping in poverty, power blackouts and garbage mountains piling up in the streets. Since the reality did not match our ambition and after the enormous catastrophe due to the Beirut explosion that shook the nation, wounded the hearts and minds out of respect to the souls of the martyrs, the pain of the wounded, the missing and the homeless, in response to the people demanding change, I announce my resignation from government, wishing my beloved nation Lebanon to regain its strength as soon as possible and to soon walk the path of unity, stability, prosperity. Long live the people and long live Lebanon. And the Afghan Grand Assembly approved on Sunday the release of 400 Taliban prisoners, the last batch among 5,000 prisoners to be freed, as a condition for the continuation of the peace talks. The decision of the lawyer Hirga has removed the last excuse on the way to peace talks. We are on the verge of peace talks, said Abdullah Abdullah, who has been appointed by the government to lead negotiations with the Taliban group. According to an official list provided by the Afghan government, many of the inmates are accused of serious of offenses, with more than 150 of them on death row. The list also includes a group of 44 insurgents of particular concern for their high profile and probability of making attacks. Who's Based on your consensus and moral decision, I sign today the decree to release the remaining 400 prisoners, and they will be released. The decision of the lawyer Yirga has removed the last excuse and obstacles on the way to peace talks. We are on the verge of peace talks. Eight people, including six French nationals, have been killed by unidentified gunmen in Niger. The French citizens, their local guide and driver were shot dead by gunmen who were riding motorcycles in a wildlife park located in the country's southwestern region. The six were employees of an international humanitarian organization. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack so far. 
The latest mission of Chinese peacekeepers to Mali has started their work in the city of Gao. The team arrived in the country last month and went into quarantine in accordance with health protocols. Their one-year mission includes patrolling infrastructure, construction and providing medical services. Mali has been gripped by violent conflicts since 2012, resulting in the deaths and displacement of thousands of people. And the leader of Mali's M5 opposition movement, Iman Mahmoud Diko, has called for fresh protests against President Ibrahim Keita. In a televised address on Sunday evening, the influential Inam, Imam asked citizens to take to the streets on Tuesday and remain there until Keita steps down. Tuesday, August 11th, in place of independence, it is a decisive day. It shows that the Malian people are a standing people. They are not a submissive or resigned people, and that we would rather die as martyrs than live as traitors. But we will have to show it on August the 11th, God willing. And Mauritania's President Mohamed Gazwani has appointed a new government following the resignation of the Prime Minister and his entire government on Thursday over alleged corruption. Several of the new former ministers were questioned by investigators about suspected corrupt activities that happened under their watch while serving in the government of former President Mohamed Abdel Aziz. It was normal to allow the Syed report to be released to prove their innocence. That's why they are among those affected by this change. The president of the republic, aware of his role as guarantor of the constitution, is committed to the principle of separation and independence of powers. And the commissioner's office at the Chinese Foreign Ministry in Hong Kong has condemned sanctions recently imposed on its officials by the United States. The officials say U.S. sanctions will be self-defeating and have no, illegal, no legal power in Hong Kong as they have been unilaterally imposed by a foreign government. They add that it has a legitimate right for countries to formulate and implement national security laws within their sovereign territory. Washington imposed sanctions on 11 Hong Kong officials on Friday as it works to obstruct and undermine efforts to safeguard national security by attacking and smearing the law and those who support it. And now we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories at our website at telesurenglish.net. Remember that you can join us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Luis De Jesus. Thank you for watching.